Welcome to the third and final session of Instructure's Digital Learning Day, brought to you by the Canvas Casters. We're closing out Digital Learning Day with a session called Empowered Teaching and Learning. And we have Ricardo, Gabriel, and Teresa here from Hacienda La Puente USD in California. Now, before we dig into this session, reminder to those of you who have been tuning in all day, off and on, same rules apply, okay? <laughs> we want you here, we want you get in the chat, engage, ask questions. Uh, we've got an amazing group here. Uh, I, I wanna say this evening, cause it is dark here on the East Coast, um, but, <laughs> but these folks, they're not even, they're not having, they haven't even dinner yet. Like they, they're still yeah. trying to wrap up the right. day. Um, so we, we're really, really honored to have them here. Uh, but we wanna just remind you folks that are tuning in, uh, be active in the chat. Let us know where you are, uh, where you teach, uh, and where you're tuning in from. And and by all means, ask some questions along the way. Marcus, you didn't say it. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday, Dad Jokes. <laughs> two, two Tuesday. Uh, Never gets old. DL, DL Day. We do have a math teacher with us, right? Gabriel, your math? Yes, sir. Is, a, is this a palindrome? Is that what this is called? Uh, I'm not actually sure if it's considered a palindrome. Look there, I'm already making mistakes. <laughs> it's just numbers, right? <laughs> I'm gonna watch you. That's the number. They're the same forward as they are backward. Okay. I don't. Uh, I don't know how it works. Before <laughs> we get started, we have fantastic people with us, and they're like, we have already started off. These jokers have got us on here. Um, we want to announce the winner of the demo slam. And yes. uh, drum roll, please. <laughs> Stephanie Bean. Stephanie, <laughs> come on up. Get your prize. Uh, no, Stephanie, you did a fantastic job. Obviously. Uh, the folks out there so excited um to, to see what you had to offer so we appreciate you um and your uh prize pack will be in the, the mail shortly we think, are so i oh, think the thing sorry eddie I, I think the thing i think what stephanie did is she just she came in hot as the kids she did maybe she used did. to say and she kind of dropped the hand right out of the gate uh and everybody did yeah. such an amazing job um but I think it was there was some you know sort of first impression, first live canvas demo yeah, slam, all of that. To, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to come in after the first, right? Yeah, um, yeah. First person to come in, uh, Kelly made it on the big time. Hey guys, watching from New Jersey, appreciate that. Uh, now, Sean Newfer is a doctor, and he says it is definitely palindrome. So <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to start any Twitter beef here but he's a doctor. So <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, woohoo, Stephanie, all the congratulations to Stephanie um, and appreciate you guys uh, being a part. We have folks joining us from Uzbekistan. I am just no absolutely way. Yeah. That's a thing. That's a thing. Look at worldwide campus casters. Um, I don't know what Whoop. time it is there. Marcus can't figure out time zones in our own country. <laughs> no, so no. Trying to figure it out. Overseas. I have to readjust calendar invitations two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? For sure. Ricardo, Teresa, Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, let's start with Ricardo. We'll work our way around the room. We'll go Ricardo, Teresa, and Gabriel. Um, introduce yourselves. Tell us uh, what you do um, and what uh, is your edu passion. Let's just start it off. I want to know what really gets you excited in education right now. Sure. First of all, thank you for having us. And before we start, actually, Eddie, I wanted to ask you and Marcus, are you guys in the doghouse? It oh. is so late over there. So I know hey. you talked about it. <laughs> I have, I have, you know, I have you know. Best, I have the best wife in the world. She came up. I had a little play. It was like it honestly reminded me of middle school lunch. She brought me a little plate. It had a sandwich. It had some chips. It even had an oatmeal cream pie. Oh my it God. It was like a snack pack already for me <laughs> at, at like 530. Just absolutely fantastic. So no, it, that, it went the other way. I thought for sure. 815 calls. That doesn't, doesn't happen a whole lot around this house. Uh, but it went the other way. No, I, Marcus and I are very blessed, I think, to have folks that... Um, that continue to love us for the things that we well, like uh, l let's get crazy. Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe. no, yes, we're very lucky. We married up both of us, but we appreciate Ricardo. We appreciate the concern for our marital. He was worried happiness. all day about it. <laughs> Teresa, it's like all day I've been stressed out about Marcus and Eddie. 
<laughs> yes, I love it. But, but yeah, going back, yeah. Uh, my name is Ricardo. Uh, I'm a tech tosa at Hacienda La Puente. Um, I started there as a Spanish teacher. Um, taught there for 20 years. Then I went and, uh, to the side of technology. Um, I was an ESL student. And honestly, my passion uh, is all things um, that are related to accessibility. I want to make sure that education is accessible to all students, regardless of barriers, such as language, socioeconomic status, cultural special need, etc. And I was reading something today and it said that we all know diversity is a fact, equity is a choice, inclusion is an action, but the magic happens when we take all of that and we make sure that our students feel like they belong. So I think for me, that's what it is, accessibility. I actually do kind of have a, like a little warm and toasty yeah. right there. I, I love that. Beautiful. Next time, please just let me go first because he always says oh. these things, and I. Oh well, that's like Marcus. Yeah, that's right. That's Marcus. He does the same thing. Look, we are. This is the same, but different. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Teresa Magpayo Castro, and I'm also a technology teacher on special assignment from Hacienda La Puente, and um, I've been up in the district for I think is it eight years now? I think so, and um, I taught a decade in the elementary field, um, every grade before I came up. And um, so I was trying to think of, as Ricardo was speaking, I was trying to think of my edu passion. And I thought of like 20 of them, but I think the show's not long enough. So I think it really boils down to um, at being an ESL student myself. Um, my passion really is to make sure um, to be a voice for all of those who don't have a voice or who are underrepresented. And um, because my experience myself and my, my family growing up in our, my educational experience and also the school that I came from for a decade, um, the population we served, they really deserve something like that. And I think that they really could have used more resources and more information to um, advocate for their students. So I think all everything boils down to that, just being a voice for everyone, but most especially those who don't have one. That's so great. All right, so I have tough acts to follow, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> they say you say best for last, but I'm, that's not oh. true. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so my name is Gabriel. I'm honored actually to, to join and thankful for Teresa and Ricardo for even thinking of me and uh, hopping on here. So for the last seven years, uh, I've been working at the district office in curriculum and instruction with Teresa, uh, but more so head powering with math. And so that's really been my, my main thing. And then I did able to fill up a 10 frame as well, like Teresa, once you thought about it, a decade actually in the classroom, both as a fourth and fifth grade teacher for myself. And so uh, now I say in addition to supporting math instruction in our district, I have opportunities sometimes to work nationally through some of my work with Solution Tree. And then uh, over the pandemic, it's been crazy. I, opportunity just kind of landed in my lap where I get to also be in a department editor for the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics or NCTM journal. And so that's been a, a, an interesting different experience. So, so that's me. And my passion, uh, math, really, I mean, for the most part, I. It's what I feel like I do and listen to on a 24 seven basis. And one of the biggest things I try to do is just kind of with students, make it so that it's not just us always doing whatever it is we're doing, but more so kind of building a community of, of thinkers and, and learners. Awesome. Thanks for that, Gabriel. Awesome. I, I feel like we got off on the wrong foot. I, I am now starting to agree with you because technically it is 02, 22, 22, 02, 2, <laughs> 02, 02, 22. <laughs> Oh boy, oh, Edward. Two, 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 two. Okay, we both the, we're off the rails already, which is fine. Uh, Marcus, why don't you just why don't you just pick it up? Why don't you yeah. pick it up where we're at? It's been a long day. The digital learning day, Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Um, I so full disclosure, and Eddie kind of mentioned it before. Uh, obviously, we've had the chance to to get to know Ricardo and Teresa a little bit. Um, you know, over the last I don't know year or so, off and on, and, and they're just doing such great things. And I, I'm really stoked to to meet Gabriel and and be able to kind of listen and get some of that math insight. Um, because as everyone who knows me at all knows, when when y'all put letters in my math. It's when I stopped paying attention. I lost it from there. So uh, when you start throwing X's and A's and B's and Y, I don't know. Um, but I, I'm actually, I'm really excited about this conversation because it really speaks to um, three individuals who are just a few of, of certainly of many uh, in, in one district 
and, and your ability and your passion collectively to serve the true needs of the folks in your district. And, and not that every district isn't looking for that, but as, as all three of you have pointed out, like there's a personal connection here that I think is really, really important and something to be celebrated. Um, so Gabriel, we don't know you yet. We're gonna get to know you. Um, but if you're working alongside these, these two, uh, Eddie and I say it all the time, I say it all the time, iron sharpens iron. So y'all are making each other even better. Uh, and I think that it's probably a pretty awesome school district. Uh, just, just knowing the three of you are, are working there. Um, so you've been doing some really great stuff, not only with Canvas, um, which we'll talk a little bit about, but also with Mastery Connect uh, to serve the diverse needs of your, your students. Um, so we just want to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, Teresa, why don't you, why don't you start us off? Uh, tell those tuning in this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you are. Um, those that will watch later, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your district in general. Tell us about Hacienda La Puente. Uh, you know, obviously California, I can't really relate. It's warm there, it's not warm here. So I'm already lost, but kind of give us the sort of the broad strokes picture of the district uh, so that everybody can have a, a gauge on things. Well, you are perfectly correct that um, our district is is wonderful and a wonderful place to work. And we are surrounded by uh, teachers and educators who are, share the same passion. So we are here because of them and we are inspired by them. So, and we're so proud to represent them today. But um, yes, you're correct. We are in sunny Southern California and it was just uh, sunny right now and rained for like 30 seconds and it's sunny again. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, <laughs> just rubbing it in at this point. We don't point. want to rub it in. I'm sorry, but I had to tell you. Um, we're about, uh, we're in the San Gabriel Valley about 20, 30 minutes from Los Angeles. So that might help you figure out where we are. And we're a pretty big district. And we serve a very diverse population of about 18,000 students. So for us, that's pretty big over here. And um, our job, as Toe says, is to train and support about 800 teachers in addition to the staff and the admin. So um, our kids are wonderful. We work with so many different kids, different walks of life. And um, they're so, you know, and, and our, our colleagues are so passionate. And so, and I know these two, I'm sure have others to say too, but um, yep, that's where we are in case you're wondering where Hacienda La Puente is. <laughs> in beautiful Southern California. <laughs> yes. where, where it rains I, for 30 second intervals. Seconds. <laughs> <laughs> absolute best i would assume ricardo um your uh your students are probably a, a fairly diverse district correct correct and i would assume that that has helped um and i i would just really be curious on what um that looks like from a digital learning standpoint we talk a lot about and i think you could probably speak to this as well we talk a lot about you know what the pandemic did to speed up a lot of the things and tools that we use but you know a lot of attention was never really given to folks that were trying digital learning before the pandemic and, and assuming that your team and, and your group has kind of been doing this way before or, or have at least started the initiatives of, you know, integrating educational technology tools. What sort of challenges or unique needs um, do you guys have there at Hacienda La Puente? Um, especially with your English language learners. I think there's some there's some folks listening, some folks watching that could definitely use that expertise on, on what that looks like in a super diverse district. Yeah, I, I think um, as Teresa mentioned, we have students that come from all um, roads of life. And you know, uh, me personally being an ESL student, um, escaping the civil war in El Salvador and coming here and remembering this like it was yesterday, I was given a, a, a test completely in English and I did horrible on it. And I remember being placed in remedial classes. And I remember my counselor in Spanish saying, pobrecito no sabe nada, like he doesn't know anything. And I basically got lost in that classroom. And it wasn't until a teacher, and you might, not, might know the name, we've been talking about math teachers, Jaime Escalante, there was a movie done about him, Stand and Deliver, came into my homeroom at Garfield High School and, and he gave me a math test in the language that I understood, 
And I was able to prove that just because I didn't have control of the language, I still could show what I can do in math. Took me out. Um, all of a sudden, um, I was, I was uh, doing better. I was able to go to college. And, you know, uh, I think that particular teacher changed my life. And I think that when I go back and think about my role when it comes to our district is how do we bring those tools to our students? Uh, I know in Canvas, how do I bring immersive reader? How do I bring reading progress? How do I bring you know, Canvas Studio for my kids to be able to speak and practice the language? How do I bring captions? I mentioned accessibility, you know, accessibility checkers. So all of these tools are, are just you know, my passion, and I want to make sure that we bring them in so that our students can benefit and succeed as I had the chance to succeed. Yeah, so many of those stories, I, I just, I love, I love what we get to do because especially after a long day like today, we've had lots of digital learning day live streams. Um, we've had a couple special announcements with some folks. It's just been uh, just a really incredible day, but it's almost, you know, cathartic to hear some of the same individuals that are doing the same types of things that work in completely different spaces, very rural Indiana, right, <laughs> where where I live, uh, compared to Southern California, very diverse population, but having a similar experience where, um, although we don't have the same story, we were brought into education by other educators or, or folks that maybe made a difference or impact into our lives. Uh, Gabriel, how did you get started in education? What what would you consider your why uh, being a part of, of Hacienda La Puente? Yeah, sure. So uh, for me personally, my mom is actually a school teacher, still is. And uh, having kind of it been early on, remember going in her classroom and kind of helping her, I decided that was kind of going to be my end goal in terms of what I was going to end up career wise. And how I fell into math kind of just, you know, being an elementary school teacher, you get a little bit of everything. And I recognized and realized, you know, I teach every content. What am I most passionate about? What do I enjoy helping kiddos kind of figure out or get that light bulb to go off and happen to be math? And so that's what I get to do. And, and the beauty behind my current position is getting into a lot of different classrooms and a lot of different grade levels and, and really just hoping to help kiddos think. I think all too often in math, it's so much concern with, did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? What's the right answer? And I really, I, I alluded to earlier, it's it's creating thinkers, getting kids to just think, how do you see it? What, what do you notice, you know? And so that's what I enjoy doing and I'm fortunate to get that opportunity to do it on an ongoing basis. Yeah, it's so good. I, I just, again, we, <laughs> there's so, my mom, my mother was an educator and I think so many folks are probably educators with children and their kids come home and say, I want to be an educator. And they go, Ooh, <laughs> in today's, <laughs> in today's world, is that something, you know? Uh, so I always love hearing folks that like come to it as after th those conversations, right? Were there, were there any pushback, Gabriel? Did your mom say, Ooh, probably not a great idea. <laughs> Mom said, uh, are you going to be a teacher for your entire career or are there other things you want to do once you get to K-12? <laughs> and I said, superintendent someday, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah. 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 I, I don't want those headaches. Right. Well, it's a, just a different set of headaches, different, different <laughs> group of headaches. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, to me, uh, you know, listening, uh, and we haven't gotten to Teresa yet, uh, but just listening to you guys, um, talk about uh, I, I think we all probably share in that and eddie kind of referenced it but you know and and no offense to like stockbrokers but like does the stockbroker have that same story right does the stockbroker when asked what made you become a stockbroker does does do those folks have that same sort of uh sort of like basic down to the DNA sort of connection to what their life's uh, path is. I don't know. Maybe they do. But every single time we talk to an educator, it's always the same. It's always somebody changed my life. Yeah. Uh, and and, and I, I get the opportunity to have these conversations on a weekly basis at the Center for Leadership and Learning. And part of the exercise that uh, educators do in those sessions is exactly this. What is your why? What made you become an educator or a leader or, or whatever it happens to be? And it's, and it's uh, they get the chance to write a, like a short letter uh, to that person. And it's guaranteed. It's Mr. Or Mrs. Miss so-and-so, uh, here's how you changed my life or Dear mom, 
Dear Dad. <laughs> and it's just every time I read them, I'm like, there's a certain yeah. kind of magic that every one of these educators worldwide shares. And that's that's really part of it. So it's just I get goosebumps just listening to folks, uh, you know, be willing to even share that with us. Yeah. And I, and I hate to say this, Marcus, but we're probably going to go three for three because Teresa has shared her story <laughs> with Canvas before um, yes. on a video that I've seen uh, for InstructureCon. <laughs> so she's uh, this is like us having a superstar on the show. Um, but I, I think a similar experience. Right, Teresa? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, you know, when I hear our stories, or even though I've heard Ricardo's story like 3 million times, it's still <laughs> amazing every time I hear it. Because when we hear our stories, it we see it in our students. And I think your initial question was, you know, the unique needs of our um, English language learners. And that's, that's big for us in our district, because in my classes that I was in, about three fourths of my class were language learners coming in. And they it's a huge range from those who know a little bit of English, those who just understand English can't speak, and those who know zero English whatsoever, and I know the two of these have experienced that as well, going into those classrooms, trying to help those students who do not understand anything and giving them the tools they need to feel like they belong in the class. But um, I'll go ahead and go into my why. And yes, I do have a story, which I just started sharing recently because, you know, anyways, who cares why? Um, so my, my first encounter in education my first year, um, I actually, my teachers thought I was mute. They thought that I could <laughs> not speak at all. And that wasn't the case because if you ask my mom, she'd be like, oh, she does not know how to stop speaking. <laughs> um, but yeah. when I was in school, I would not speak at all. And it wasn't because I didn't have a voice to speak, but because I didn't speak the language or I didn't understand, I didn't feel comfortable enough to speak. So I went a whole school year without saying anything. And um, I feel like I'm so passionate about what we do now um, because I feel like if we, myself, Ricardo, Gabriel, if we had these tools back then, how big of a difference it would have made for us. So, you know, um, so I, I think that's, that's really why, you know, I just wanted to be that voice for people because I needed it when I was younger. So, so that's my little story. And um, yeah, it, it inspires us all the time to help these students and these teachers who need help. Yeah, there used to be an old video that that talked about access. And there was like, they put two people on a stage, there was a curtain in between them. They gave one group of books, and they gave another one access to technology. And they were asking questions. And they were like, well, this isn't fair. Like, why do they keep answering? And it's the same thing. Like, I think that's what Marcus and I have been really passionate about with education. It just, it levels the playing field. Um, and, and more exactly. access equals mm -hmm. more equity, which equals, you know, some really great experiences that you can have in, um, some districts, uh, like yours. So I just love it. I, I, you know, so many people in the chat are like, love to hear the why stories, um, hearts giving me chills. Just, uh, it really resonates. So thank you for sharing those. Now, in addition to somebody's microwave beeping, <laughs> <laughs> So we know Ricardo, it's not Eddie. Ricardo's, Ricardo's got a hot pocket. He's got a hot pocket in the microwave. <laughs> we know it's yeah, we know it's not Eddie because he already had his oatmeal cream pie for dinner. <laughs> it was a nice spread of chips. <laughs> um, so, cream. but in addition to clearly now we've established that these are wonderful human beings and educators. We've heard that. We kind of already knew that already. We just wanted to share that with the rest of the world here. Um, but you guys have been able to be so impactful with not only Canvas, but also Mastery Connect um, in serving your district. So I'm going to direct this towards the new guy, the math guy. Um, Gabriel, tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been doing with Mastery Connect so far and kind of where you are in that process and and maybe some of the goals that you've, that you've got utilizing that tool. Thanks. Uh, so this has our, been our inaugural year in Hacienda La Puente with uh, having Mastery Connect. And it is our new to us assessment platform. And one of the things that I've kind of realized as our digging and trying to troubleshoot and problem solve, uh, as you do with new things, is the fact that you know, Canvas has, at least inside of Mastery Connect, inside of Canvas, is new really for a lot of people. So I, I'll never forget kind of one of the first things I did this year was, was of course, YouTube, go search. You know, let's see what's out there. What are people doing? What, what, what's happening? And I was like, I'm seeing a lot of Mastery Connect videos, but I'm seeing a lot of videos just talking about Mastery Connect in just Mastery Connect land. Uh, there's not too much videos out there, or there at least there weren't. Um, 
when we looked at how is Beam Mastery Connect being utilized, implemented with, with its integration inside of Canvas. And I know with us having Canvas last year, we wanted to be able to leverage that. How can we take what we used and, and implement that with our new, a new to us assessment platform? And, and really it's, it's been, a, a, you know, just like you would expect anything new. It, it's, it takes a lot of our community partners being able to tinker around, to roll up our sleeves and, and just kind of explore and, and figure out what works best. Um, sometimes you think about, you know, hey, just look what other people are doing. Why reinvent the wheel? But as I mentioned, there wasn't too much of it out there. Um, I think sometimes I laugh when I call the support hotline over there at, at uh, Mastery Connect and, and they, some of them recognize my voice and it's just because of our opportunities to be able to converse. And, and so um, it's, it's been a good learning experience for all of us. I think for us, one of the big things we were trying to do is kind of meet each group wherever they may be. So you talk about your community partners and kind of, we have obviously teachers, administrators, parents, students, um, just every single person involved in trying to make sure we, we ensure that those people get the support that they need. You know, for our administrators, it's obviously looking and digging into data. For our teachers, it's the ability to start from scratch this new platform, kind of set up your account, create these trackers or these maps, and how can I get these assessments in the hands of my students? How do I administer an assessment? Um, and, then, and then for us, it, it, a lot of digging around in terms of getting basically all the answers, right? Because if you're gonna be in a support role, you don't always have the answers, but a lot of times you're expected to be able to either find them or have them already in the in the back burner. So um, it's been it's been a lot of learning for us, and it's been great because um, I always love just in general learning things because you want to be a resource, you want to be a support, you want to be able to offer something to somebody when when they shoot you an email, whatever time they offer uh, the need, you know. And so it's been it's been a great learning experience for us, and and hopefully for everyone that's been involved. And when I think about us and some of the things we're trying to do. You know, this year has been kind of hectic and crazy, I'm sure, for, for all educators. But but uh, at least in our case, we can't be offering the same type of supports we may have done previously just because of some of the demands that have been taxed on this year. And so one of the things we really try to do is is recognize and realize teachers don't stop when the bell rings like that's We all know that. And so sometimes teachers are working at odd hours in the evening because it fits their schedule. Sometimes teachers are working on the weekends and we can't always support them at that moment. And so one of the, the amazing things that before I even kind of at least stepped more into the position that I'm in now, Teresa and Ricardo had set up a, a, our district's YouTube channel. And so they have tons of, of help videos and tutorials that are really personalized to our district. Because I could turn on a video and say, hey, look, how does Canvas work with in general? But how does it work in our district? And so we have a lot of those how-tos to the minutia of however it might be, whether it be an administrator thing that they're trying to troubleshoot or for a teacher. And so we were able to create those, I think, you know, really pinpointed tutorial videos for our own teachers or our own administrators so they can best be able to navigate the platform and, and get the help when they need it. So that's some of the things we've been doing with regards to, to Mastery Connect. And it's crazy because I we've, it's only been, what, how many months we've been in school? But I feel like we've been with the program for a lot longer just because we've been able to see, you know, that almost that symbiotic relationship that Canvas has with Mastery Connect. I don't know, a lot of times teachers will talk about you know, this Mastery Connect or this Canvas, and I try to explain to them, well, the way we want you to use Mastery Connect, it's it's in Canvas. It's all part of Instructure. And so we try to help people to realize that, you know, you can create a test inside of your Canvas course almost. You can be able to use that same test inside of your Canvas course. There's so much that you can do once you pair the two together. And I think that for teachers, sometimes we always are looking for time savers. How can my life become just a little bit easier? Take something off the plate. And I know that, that being something new kind of feels like for some of our teachers, and it even feels like for me at times that this isn't necessarily something being alleviated. But when you think about and compare that to what we had before, I mean, one of the big things that I know teachers would have to do, even just kind of when we talk about these benchmark seasons or testing district interims, however you kind of want to phrase it, wherever neck of the woods you're at, because we all have them, right? It, it's, I got to find the test. What tests am I needing to give to my students? And so teachers would go and they'd search and they're finding, maybe they typed it in wrong or they can't find the right ID number, you know, trying to find those things. And with us, with regards to us having, you know, Mastery Connect inside of Canvas, we, in the initial phases, really try to set up these maps, which, I mean, those are mind boggling. The fact that you can sit there and kind of just move standards around, the fact that you can kind of get teachers to understand, hey, I know that you're, for example, a second grade teacher. These are all the things you're going to need. Let me go ahead and prepackage that ahead of time for you and then give that to you so that once you create your course inside of Canvas, which we're all using Canvas, 
all those assessments that when they trickle down to you are going to come and land inside of your stuff. So it does take a lot off of the plates when you put it through that lens. And I, and I know that this is really our second trimester with Mastery Connect. And already we're finding a lot smoother of a ride because we encountered more of those hiccups or blips along the way, if you will, earlier on in the first uh, first few months of our implementation with Mastery Connect. So I've been talking for a lot. Um, <laughs> hopefully that calculated some of the stuff we've been doing in our in our Dex district. Absolutely, absolutely. I I um, with Mastery Connect and, and just assessment in general. Uh, I was a corporation test coordinator. Um, at a couple of districts. And so that meant I was the person responsible for making sure all the state standardized testing was, you know, scheduled properly and everybody had all the things they needed. And, um, you know, the, the thing that I've come to realize, and I think learning more about Mastery Connect has helped me realize this, is that there is a mindset shift that I think is probably necessary when it comes to assessment, where we have the ability by not only providing a, a, a strong solution for assessment, but then also building it into the environment that they're already using Canvas, we've got the ability now to sort of take a lot of danger out of assessment. Because what do kids think? I mean, I, I say kids, what do, we, what do teachers think? You know, when, when, when I'm a classroom teacher and it, it, it's been a while, but it hadn't been that long, I know, I remember, oh, benchmarks. Benchmark testing's coming up. Like this is this, this is going to decide whether I'm doing my job or not, you know, like immediate, like punitive feelings. Uh, and, and that's me as an adult who has some control over my emotions most of the time. Um, but imagine being a kid, you know, imagine, imagine being young and, and feeling that same type of pressure. And, and what I've seen from district after district who's using uh, in early stages of, of Mastery Connect or even evolved after, you know, multiple years is it's if used properly you can remove so much of that punitive emotion for everyone because you know uh, teachers can sit around at a plc right and we can all have our data uh, gabriel gabriel said this is the this is the tracker we're using uh for first trimester and these are the standards that are covered and now we're all going to sit down at our plc and we're going to discuss this without ego Ed educator and educator shoulder and shoulder and we're gonna say i see this i notice this i wonder this uh about what i'm seeing here with the data because we want to have you know informed decision making based on that and i i i've said it eddie and and we've said it a number of times as we've learned more about master connect over the past years a uh, couple of years if i had <laughs> we said this this morning about impact if i had mastery connect cooked right on into canvas you know in you know 12 years ago yeah. uh man oh man i mean so you know I, when i think about the work that you all do and and the teachers that you work uh, you know hand in hand shoulder to shoulder with you know i always think it's really important to just sort of rethink how we look at these things and not look at them as extra things but they're like empowering things these things make me better at my job that makes yep. it easier to differentiate it makes it easier to meet the needs of students and yeah i got to learn some stuff to get there yeah you know since hacienda la punta is you're leveraging mastery connect very well uh, gabriel <laughs> told us all about it don't ever apologize for talking too much marcus <laughs> and i talk all the time and no one wants to hear us so it's right. nice to have it is very nice to have someone else here that that kind of takes the takes the talking points uh, away and um you know we do feel it, this isn't just corporate speak marcus and i have seen both tools we've used both tools um in in some shape or form but you know the integration of mastery connect and canvas that powerful combination of both those solutions together are incredible right they, they just really do work well um and make sense it's hard to find ed tech products that not only work well but also makes sense for our instance. Um, but we are the Canvas casters. There is the word Canvas in our names somewhere. <laughs> Not just a clever <laughs> name. We started, right? Not just a clever name. So let's talk Canvas a bit. Uh, Ricardo, um, can you tell us a little bit about what Canvas looks like right now at, at Hacienda, uh, Hacienda La Puente? Um, you know, your journey with it so far, where you guys at are at in your Canvas adoption? Um, I'm not quite sure. I, it's been a while since we talked, so I'm, I'm a little unsure on, on where you're at these days, but, uh, give us a little bit more about, about canvas at, uh, 
HLP USD. Sure. So we are in our second year of our Canvas LMS implementation, and it really has been a roller coaster with a lot more ups than downs, I would say. Okay. Uh, before Good the news. pandemic, before the pandemic, our district had a different official LMS. But let's focus on life since Canvas. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> honestly, yeah, honestly, you know, no, I mean, I'll go back, you know, our, our, uh, uh, people used to use that other LMS. Just to, That's what it was. <laughs> and, and, and some of our, our teachers were also using Google Classroom. Uh, but we really have to give credit to our district leadership for adopting an MLS that not only, you know, uh, it's great for our school, but it's allowing our TK to 12 students to function in it. And they're probably going to be seeing it at the higher ed when they move on into college. Um, our biggest challenge, I have to say, that I was trying to onboard 800 teachers <laughs> uh, right before uh, starting, you know, distance learning. Uh, but again, our administrators did an amazing job working with Canvas uh, to provide training during the summer. And then the tech tosses came in, and I think we had weekly trainings, and we kind of took Canvas and broke it into pieces, and we focused on uh, one day was modules, one day was pages, one day was uh, mastery pads, one way was Canvas Studio. And I think little by little, we started having success, and we started seeing our teachers using it. And, and it's just great to see our teachers coming back from distance learning and still using these tools in their classroom now because they saw the value. Uh, if I have to say one thing that I'm proud of is our SIS Canvas gracing integration. <laughs> the ability, I'm, I have to say that, the ability for our teachers to just go click and their grades go automatically from Canvas into their SIS. Mm -hmm. It is just amazing. Yeah, I listen, anytime you say SIS and easy <laughs> and a click and yeah, you've, my ears are perked. Uh, right. Teresa, what, what, what about you? Is, is there one particular moment that stands out to you um, that told you Canvas is, is making a difference for us at our district? Uh, yeah, a few one particular moments, if you don't okay. mind. No, yeah, go for absolutely. it. But before I go on, just so you know, when that whole thing started, Gabriel was also a tech Tosa with us. So he's been oh. with us on this journey, hey, training the go. teachers as well. So, um, you know, for me, it was especially during that time that Ricardo was describing, it was seeing TK students going into Canvas to view and do their lessons. Can you imagine these little little kids who've never been in school, TK? And um, and also just hearing our teachers, those teachers are say, who say, I suck at talk technology or I I'm not a tech, you know, but you go into their Canvas courses and they're like streamlining their instruction like a boss, like they were yeah. doing amazing and, um, this might not be a result of Canvas, but definitely a correlation. Um, I think like uh, Marcus mentioned earlier, it allowed us to level the playing field. Teachers really had no choice, <laughs> no choice but to jump in at that time because of the state of the world. And Canvas was our vehicle to provide equitable instruction and support to students and their families. So not just the kids, the parents and the their families were in there with them, you know, assisting them and making sure they're on task and doing what they needed to do. And I think um, this experience with Canvas had empowered our teachers to um, leave their comfort zones, to think outside of the box and to think of instruction and teaching in a new way because they really had no choice, but they still did amazing. And I'm so proud. You know, I, I say it over and over, but I'm so proud of our teachers and our students. And I can't believe that um, this is only our second year using Canvas. I asked Carver, I asked Ricardo, I'm like, is this really just our second year? He's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they've done amazing. That, and that the that's the, the we've said that too, and I think a lot of folks when you're able to sort of zoom out like 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 Teresa just did and like kind of try to see the big picture, um, just the fact that um, utilizing Canvas, utilizing these tools in, in intentional ways is is ultimately leading to teachers improving and uh, incrementally improving understanding that you know what we've been through in education over the last couple of years is continually changing and like you said comfort zone getting out of that comfort zone um but it's i mean what better group of human beings to you know we all would say we're lifelong learners and so you know yeah we got kind of pushed off a cliff uh you know in the last couple of years but you know, there's no better group of human beings to say, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to land on our feet and we're just going to keep on going. Um, but the, the piece of that, that I think is really important for folks to sort of keep in mind or remember is, is the, 
how much of what was happening when there was, you know, quarantine and lockdown, that fully virtual, fully distant learning is now finding its way and s things are sticking, you know, things stick into our now what's becoming a more blended uh, approach to learning. Yeah. And that's what I love is, uh, you know, when folks say, oh, I was doing, I had teachers saying this all the time. I was doing this and now, now we're back in school and I can do it the same way uh, because it was what was working when my kids were spread out all over the county. But now they're in the same space, but I can still do that because I learned, I, I, I sort of improved on those skills and, and sort of yeah. Canvas was just the, like you said, the vehicle, the environment for that, which is just, yeah. isn't that what we're working towards is to just sure. be better. So Gabriel, you've been, you've been on this journey with them together uh, as a Tech Tosa. Talk a little bit about Canvas. Is there a, is there something that stood out to you as in your role as kind of a, uh, a math Tosa, uh, a math tech Tosa. Uh, uh, is there something that you've seen that's just been, because let's be honest, uh, we'll just be straight with a lot of folks. There are a lot of math teachers. When you say LMS, they say <laughs> hit the door uh, yeah. <laughs> because, because I can't do those equations inside that tool. Trust me. I've tried 9,000 times. Uh, just something we might hear here in Indiana. Uh, so I'm curious from your, uh, from your point of view um, as a math teacher, uh, what sort of things did you see in Canvas? Well, so it's amazing to me, just as some of my colleagues have spoken earlier, to see the creativity and ingenuity of our teachers. You know, I, I'll never forget when I first learned about us using Canvas and I was speaking to some uh, fellow math teachers in the district about some of my thoughts about how we might be able to utilize, not just in terms of solving problems, equations and things like that, just how might we might use this for math. And so one of the big things we talked about is the idea of, in math, we want more kids talking. We want more discourse, more discussions. And one of the things that me and a colleague kind of hammered through was how could we be able to use the discussions platform to pose whether it be a prompt, a, a problem, a task, and get students to be able to interact with one another based upon that. So I, I can't say and speak fully to the fact that, you know, all of our teachers, whether it be math or any other content, completely love it. But I definitely feel that there's always a niche. How can you be able to tweak what is there to make it meet your needs? Um, one of the things that stood out to me, honestly, is, is actually more recently. I know that all of us would admit that this year has been, with at least in our district and, and in many districts, uh, the first year fully returned back to in-person instruction. We've been a lot of you know issues with regards to the sub shortages and, and the, that has in turn allowed us to be out in the, there in a lot of classrooms subbing. And one of the things I've seen, it just really kind of just been like, thank goodness, is the fact that when we have teachers that are out, the ability for them to be able to plan and create relevant and meaningful lessons for their students although they're not there. I think one really stood out to me was most recently, I was in a third grade classroom. Uh, in, in that third grade class, you know, the teacher had literally taken cool chunks of her modules that she probably worked and spent hours creating. And she was able to use those this year with her students. And I think that that for the most part, you know, didn't let her kids miss a beat. You know, when you come in as a sub, you, you, don't, you don't know the students, they don't know your routines. And it's all of these things you're kind of just trying to figure out. At least I think we have the, the upper hand because at the very least we know a lot of the curriculum and content platforms. So I can get into whether it be science or math or, or any of the contents, but I think most subs can't always do that. And so that what that teacher was able to utilize with, I'm sure again, her, her endless time spent creating those modules is how can I leverage that to be able to make use of when I'm not there, you know, the, the, the closest to me being there, because no one can ever replace a teacher. You know what I mean? They, the, all the things that they bring, all the community that they, they create with their students. So this is just kind of, in my opinion, Canvas is helping bridge that gap when we have so many teachers and students out. For sure. The uh, it, when you when you talk about when, you know, the, the attendance challenges that we've all faced in education, either the, the students or the adults, um, the that just reminded me i i eddie's again he's going to be like all right heard this one uh but i i became you know the most the most popular english teacher in the school building because i was one of those who immediately started using canvas um even when it was quote unquote optional right like in the early year uh for us this was you know eight or nine years ago when we got canvas uh my, at my first district and and it was sort of like, yeah, we'll start dabbling a bit and we'll, you know, we'll just sort of see how it goes. And, and I got all fired up about it and started using it every day in class, class as well. And, it, you know, it was one of those things where if I did miss a day, 
my lesson plan was a piece of cake, Gabriel. It was like the lesson plan that I left was dear whoever, tell students to get on canvas. Please take attendance. Sincerely and thank you, Marcus. End of lesson plan. Because I could put it there and I had, you know, I hate to say it this way, but like they were trained. We were we were using Canvas as part of our face-to-face -face time. They knew what to do. And so, boy, oh boy, this is back before the pandemic when we, you know, theoretically had people to sub. <laughs> uh, they, they were lining up to sub for Marcus because they knew like this was going to be a piece of cake. Um, and, and as long as the kids didn't burn the classroom down, we were good. We were good, uh, but that's a that's a great point in terms of like how we incorporate Canvas into our day to day, then eases, uh, and and really sort of smooths the pathway for for teaching and learning for everybody because it's part of our everyday. It's routine and it's sort of a habit. Um, so I, I really I really like that. Uh, for the folks tuning in here, okay, where we want to focus a little bit more on. The English language learners. Um, so I, I, I added this. Here's what they're. I, I don't know if our guests notice this at the bottom of the our, our planning doc. I added a new question. Hey, -o, uh, to keep you on the keep you on 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 the edge here a little bit. Um, <laughs> so this is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie, Eddie, he warned me. He was like, "Don't be springing on any, anything new on, on Teresa because she's gonna she's gonna be mad." Start crying, um, you know. <laughs> but but I think I think you can speak to this, um, and I think that this is again something that people tomorrow um, could probably go and sit down maybe during a prep time and say, "You know what? I remember the thing they talked about last night. I want to check that out." Um, so as it pertains to your English language learners, what is a? Um, we'll start with Ricardo, then Teresa, then then. Gabriel, um, what's a try it tomorrow tip that you might have uh, for uh, teachers out there who are, are maybe struggling with uh, or feel less confident in how they're serving the needs of their English language learners? There are, there are so many, and I'll let um, Teresa talk about Studio. I know it's Eddie's favorite, but Immersive Reader for me. Surprise, what? Oh, no. Immersive Reader is a tool that it's not a screen reader, but it's a reading enhancement tool that is inside of Canvas. And you know what I love about Canvas is that they're always making it better. It used to be available mm -hmm. on pages. Mm -hmm. Now it's available on syllabus. It's avail available on assignments. And if you get creative, you can put it somewhere else, too. We did a, a little thing with Eddie where we did accessibility. And Immersive Reader, along with Studio, were big parts. But for me, Immersive Reader is something that will help me when I was an ESL student. And we've seen it help our students. And we see our teachers use it all the time. Oh, so Marcus, just so you know, we saw you sneak in that question. So nice try being sneaky there. It didn't I work. I thought I was. I thought I was. We saw it like thirty seconds before the show. Nice, very nice. Um, I didn't see it. <laughs> she is. We surprised Gabriel, so it's okay. Mission accomplished. Um, <laughs> so for me, like uh, Ricardo ruined it for me. Thanks a lot. Uh, for me, would be studio for sure. Um, the ability to put in subtitles, closed captioning for our students who um, either can't, you know, are hard of hearing, cannot hear, or for our students who have challenges with language as well. Um, but I also have to throw in their studio quizzes because, you know, when you create the studio quizzes, students are able to go at their own pace. They're able to revisit material that they need. And so I think that's a big deal, especially for our language learners to be able to slow down, to review, um, and to go at their own pace with studio quizzes. So I think for me, that would be a lot of teachers don't even know, and and that was one of the most amazing things. So that would be definitely something I would try tomorrow. Yes. Uh, might try it tomorrow because you surprised me. I, I bet you I could have a better one if I had more time. But honestly, one of the <laughs> one of the things that's all right, you, know, you succeeded. I felt good. Um, <laughs> I, I think in like you know when you're a teacher, you're always trying to give feedback for your students, and one of the biggest things I think a lot of times is kids don't always read necessarily what you say and they may take it out of context. I mean, that's a reality. I think about some of the text messages or emails I've sent. I'm like, did they get what I was trying to say? And so uh, just the ability that you have inside of Canvas to be able to record some of your feedback as a teacher might be able to help kiddos who are struggling either to read or may not fully understand what you were trying to recommend for them. So the ability that you as a teacher have when you're going to easy grade pro, or sorry, when you're going to easy grader to be able to speed grader, sorry, to be able to record your voice, to be able to provide that feedback, I think is helpful. 
Man, I Mark, tell you what, they, I, they hit the they hit the, all the the top like the top I, three of our. Of did our, we get yeah, it right? Did we pass? Back. For sure, for sure. So so here's the thing. First of all, uh, Gabriel clearly clearly um, you know maybe read a popular book out there because I feel like he was really speaking to my soul there about <laughs> feedback. But uh, that's for another time. Uh, yeah. But I've got my own. I got my own. I asked you guys because I wanted to uh, see if you were gonna steal my idea but um and those are those are obviously like those are top three for sure um one of the things that i was really impactful for me as a teacher um is it's not rocket science it was just sort of a re focusing as a teacher on what am i really trying to accomplish with this particular task and so having multiple submission types on assignments Mm -hmm was the biggest thing and i always tell the same story um i had a i had a language english language learner who was a sophomore in high school he was at a level two um uh speaker and so you know very limited uh language skills verbally and um he was very bright and he could read well really well um as far as i can tell but he was just very quiet. And when, when Teresa was speaking earlier about, you know, her childhood experience, I immediately thought uh, uh, of Osvaldo because um, that's when I really realized, I think that was probably one of those first moments where I figured out that the technology was gonna make his learning better. And, and it was all, like, it was the thing that was gonna f- maybe fix uh, a challenge. He was, just mortified to to get up in front of the class or even to speak up in any way shape or form even if it was a as simple as a yes or a no response to a question um and we of course were you know of course as you could imagine like the worst case scenario speeches right and so uh where you know most of the other students had to go up in front of the class and stand behind the podium and have their prepared you know notes or whatever um it dawned on me because of what was built into canvas even back then i was like wait a minute he's got media recorder here like he can record himself and it dawned on me like a huge freight train of bricks like do i need him to get in front of the class and go through that fear and anxiety is that part of the outcome i'm looking for no what the outcome I wanted was, in this case, for him to explain steps of a process, right? To be able to, to do that. So where I had other students who were stronger with language, they did the speech. He did his in a media recorded, turned in assignment. And that was huge for him. And, and he, he told me afterwards, like, that was a big deal because I was able to say, turn out and turn off all of the other exterior stuff and you just you're just talking to me and that was a huge deal and that's when i realized just how powerful the you know the technology in general can be when we as educators focus on what are we really trying to gain what are we really trying to trying to learn here and in that case he was able to practice his fluency um he had he had written exactly what he wanted to say. So he'd worked on his writing skills. I was able to see that. And I was able, because of the technology, to remove the garbage that really wasn't pertinent. And so when I listened to Teresa earlier and hearing these stories about, you know, uh, sort of these success stories, it always really gets me fired up about, you know, I want everybody to be able to recognize uh, the power of, of what you're doing every day with kids. You know, I want to end on this. Just give some final thoughts here. I wonder how many, and Hildy has a great point, um, to not be afraid to use these tools um, for EL students uh, and, and and young learners as well. I think so often um, we have to find ways to, to mindset shift educators that look at these tools and just say, they can't even read English. How are they going to be able to figure out how to utilize Canvas or how are they going to be able to figure to utilize Mastery Connect? And um, what sort of what sort of things would you say to that? I, I, I think I, a lot of what's been said already is like 
you know, we have to think differently, but I'm just curious on, on what messages have stuck with folks, whether that be in your district or things that you've seen around the country for those people that do say, or those people that do think this is just too hard for them. You know, uh, uh, this is very personal to me because my daughter has a lot of uh, issues when it comes to reading, and I think Marcus put it right on the head. Uh, the ability for students to have choice, and I think our teachers have bought into this, that now is, you know what, just because I can show you that I can master that with writing, I can show it to you through a video, or I can show it to you by creating a website, or I can show it to you by doing this other thing. And I think choice, and our teachers have embraced this, and the ability to let our students show mastery the way they can show mastery to us. Yeah, and I yeah, think I um, our teachers being able to share their experience, teachers seeing fellow teachers using it successfully, it's kind of like, oh, I can't really say I can't do it. These teachers are doing it. And so they're my same grade level. They're my same district. And so sharing our teacher stories is so is so powerful as well. And we have teachers who are who would love to share their success stories. And so being able to share that across the district has inspired people to say, you know what? I'll give it a try because they did, you know, so I think that has helped a lot for us. Uh, of course, I go back to math because I can't help it. And I think that all too often uh, teachers will say, like, my kids can't solve that problem. I haven't taught them how to do it yet. And, and I think day in, day out, everyone will know this and recognize this. Kids just surprise us. They blow us away. They, mm -hmm. they really are truly amazing. So I'm always eager to kind of get the opportunity for students to show us or prove us wrong and that, you know, they may not be the experts and they may not know all the ins and outs, but they're not afraid to be able to give things a try. And, you know, more often than not, they're going to be able to get at least a, a pathway to be able to either arrive at the right answer or a pathway to be able to kind of get whatever it is they're trying to get going. So. Yeah, I love that. Thank you guys so much. Um, I, I, we cannot thank you enough. Uh, we know there's, we, we spent some days working out schedules and, you know, Marcus has got to read, um, you know, time zone calendars for the next 150 <laughs> days so he can figure out what time it is in, in Southern California. But, um, you know, we, we cannot thank you enough, Gabriel, Ricardo, Teresa, for sharing your story today, helping us celebrate and, and kind of finishing off what has been a pretty fantastic day, Marcus, Digital Learning Day. Not bad for a couple of schmoes running a podcast <laughs> to be able to, to throw this together. So um, we also want to thank all of you that have tuned in today live, who have watched us uh, throughout the day, and then we'll watch us later on. So uh, thanks for watching us March 1st, whoever you may be watching us on March 1st. Uh, the work that you guys do is, is extremely impactful. Um, profoundly important, uh, and as Marcus and I normally say, often thankless um, to shaping our students' futures. So we do appreciate everything you've done. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Be sure to follow Canvas LMS and Structure, all of the things. And Marcus and I would always appreciate the random subscribe here on <laughs> social media platforms or uh, on the podcast to stay up to date on all of the latest news and notes coming out of Instructure because we're a little bit official now. Um, so subscribe to the Canvas Casters podcast wherever you listen. It'd be great to hear more about insights just like this that we got today that was so fantastic. Thanks everybody for joining. We appreciate you. Ricardo, Teresa, Gabriel, thank you again so much. Thank you.